sure. Right All right, thank you guys so much for being here. Um, thank you to our amazing panelists. Um, so before we get started, just going to set the scene really quickly on net neutrality. I'm sure for many of you who have been following it closely, you know that there's a lot going on. Um, Basically what happened is the FCC repealed the rules in December, and now there are several efforts to either bring them back or kind of keep that effort in place. So there's the CRA that's going through the Senate and the House right now. There's uh, various forms of litigation that are being brought by state attorneys general, as well as different public interest groups. And uh, states are also looking to introduce their own bills and implement executive orders that could keep net neutrality around. So there's a couple different ways forward. And what we're really here to talk about today is which one of those seems the most feasible, which seems plausible, what can we expect um, from here on out? And so I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about where they stand on the issue and what they see as the immediate kind of next step for net neutrality moving forward. So uh, we let's start with Andy and welcome Baron. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Yes, I think you push that button. Yeah, there we go. Sorry, I'll start over. I'm Angie Cronenberg. I'm the Chief Advocate and General Counsel at Encompass. Encompass is a trade association that represents internet and network companies. So the network companies are both wired and wireless companies that are delivering the traffic of ISPs directly to consumers or the backbone of the internet. And then their internet companies are actually content companies providing uh, different platforms for consumers to use once they're on the internet to communicate with their friends, families, um, and also to engage in you know, entertainment, um, watching content, and then also you know, doing things like putting out their views, um, blogging, hosting their websites. And so Encompass has been involved in the net neutrality debate for years. Um, and we worked on the 2010 rulemaking as well as the 2015 rulemaking and then again um, in the repeal process. We have been one of the trade associations that has spent a lot of time and effort on the legal and the economic issues related to net neutrality. We are pro net neutrality. We believe in the strong protections that the 2015 order presented. So the no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization, and no throttling at interconnection um, points. So we continue to work on net neutrality. We plan to file an appeal of the FCC's decision once it's ripe for such an appeal. Um, but we're also working here in Congress to help solve the problem. So I know that there have been some that have come out and have said, Congress should now act to address this issue, but since we don't have federal protections in place, we would agree with that. So you know, we look forward to working with the staffs here um, in Congress and with the various members to, come to have a net neutrality policy that reflects the strong policy that we've traditionally had on a bipartisan basis here in the US. I'll leave it at that. Hi, thanks for having me. Matt Brill, uh, I am uh, chair of the communications practice at Latham and Watkins, and I represent a lot of broadband providers in the net neutrality context. I've represented NCTA in front of the FCC and in the Court of Appeals process, and I represent a number of the individual cable broadband providers as well. And my clients um, are strongly committed to principles of net neutrality, and they have, in fact, incorporated those principles into their business. Um, and they've made very public and prominent commitments to remain faithful to net neutrality principles. So a lot of the debate we've had over time is really how best to effectuate those principles, what's the appropriate legal framework that the FCC can employ or Congress can enact to enshrine net neutrality as the law of the land. And my clients, um, while supportive of, of transparency and while they've pledged not to block or throttle internet traffic or to discriminate unfairly, um, have, have long opposed regulation under Title II of the Communications Act, which is common carrier regulation. And the principal reason for that opposition is that it sweeps so broadly and, and creates such uncertainty that ultimately we feel it, it creates chilling effects that undermine investment and innovation. And it's really counterproductive in ways that go well beyond the net neutrality debate. And one of the principal concerns is that Title II actually imposes rate regulation and the FCC did agree in 2015 to forbear from some of the most onerous aspects of rate regulation, setting rates in advance. It, it specifically refused to forbear from uh, rate regulation in other manners and complaint-driven rate regulation. So 
from an industry perspective, our goal has been to find a path towards consensus net neutrality protections, but without the, the uh, overhang of Title II regulation. Our hope is that we can work together with other stakeholders on legislation that does codify consensus principles. Um, to me, that's the only path forward, toggling back and forth between different approaches at the FCC every few years, every time there's an administration change, isn't good for any stakeholder. We have a lot of uncertainty. We, we continually end up in the courts and um, really finishing this debate and, and settling on a, a, an appropriate framework at the federal level is clearly the best path forward. In the meantime, I think the FCC has put in place important and meaningful regulatory backstops. The Federal Trade Commission will have oversight of broadband practices. The FTC will continue to enforce transparency. One of the things we're seeing today that I don't think is constructive is for individual states to get in on this debate and enact their own legislation, their own executive orders. That's really counterproductive because this is quintessentially an interstate issue that needs to be addressed at the federal level. Um, what it's like voice over IP and wireless, we, we need a federal regime. We can debate what that regime should look like, <coughs> but I hope we do in the context of legislation, uh, but we can't have s individual states deciding their own net neutrality policy. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Lewis. I'm vice president at Public Knowledge. We're a, a nonprofit public interest advocacy group uh, focusing on the importance of an open internet and freedom of, freedom of expression online. And so uh, net neutrality is one of our top issues. Um, we, uh, like, like Angie, uh, we are also looking uh, at opportunities both to challenge the decision that the FCC uh, made in December in court, uh, but we're also uh, open to other options to make sure that we protect um, uh, the core principles of net neutrality, no, no blocking, no throttling, no paid prioritization. And while doing so, uh, empower the FCC to protect consumers uh, and, and their use of broadband uh, uh, generally. And so um, I think, you know, where, where we differ, where, where you might hear some of the same principles, say that Matt, Matt highlighted, uh, we would add a few more, but also there are important non-net neutrality protections that uh, that come at the FCC that uh, are important to consumers. So when you think about the ability to ensure uh, truth in billing or affordable access to broadband, uh, when you think of uh, uh, the ability for the disability, uh, disability community to connect online, when you think of a number of, of just basic oversight uh, that you want when consumers have very few choices in companies to access the internet, uh, it's important that there's a cop on the beat that is there to, uh, to, to protect consumers in those ways. And, and that's why the FCC was created, and that's why we were very disappointed with the decision uh, not only to roll back the net neutrality rules uh, in December, but to reclassify uh, uh, from Title II to Title I, uh, essentially for the first time in, in a couple of decades, taking the FCC off the beat and giving the FTC uh, what limited authority it has, uh, the power to try and protect consumers. This is, uh, we think, a stark uh, departure from the tradition of the FCC where bipartisan uh, commissions have, have worked to protect an open internet over many years um, and have worked to try and find the correct legal uh, uh, footing to have strong rules that everyone can agree to. Um, it is possible for Congress to fix this. Uh, we're, we're strong supporters of an effort to repeal uh, the decision in, uh, made in December uh, through the CRA. Uh, we're open to good legislation. We haven't seen any legislation that we like at Public Knowledge, but we're open to good legislation as well. Um, uh, but I, I think, you know, uh, it's important that Congress steps up and acts quickly uh, while we are in a space where there are no clear rules that keep internet service providers in line and assure consumers that they have a right to uh, not have their content blocked or throttled. Uh, or set up into paid prioritization schemes. Uh, I'm Baron Soka. I run a think tank called Tech Freedom. Uh, I've spent the last decade of my life on this issue okay. since working for Matt at Latham and Watkins. And I can tell you that uh, Matt is not only one of the best lawyers in town, but also one of the nicest. And if you're an associate at a law firm, you could hardly do better than finding someone who will actually uh, uh, educate you and not, uh, not um, treat you the way that many partners uh, treat associates in the uh, salt mines of law firm world, as many of you may know. Uh, so over the last 10 years, Tech Freedom has been engaged in this debate, uh, really first and foremost as a legal debate. This is, uh, I think Chris um, put the cart before the horse when he talked about the FCC 
repealing rules and also reclassifying broadband. In fact, it's just the opposite. If you read the order carefully, what the order uh, turns on is a, a reading of the Communications Act, an understanding of what it means, what Congress meant in 1996 when it amended the Communications Act to uh, instantiate the distinction that had long been drawn by the FCC between what were called enhanced and basic services. And my view is exactly that of Democrats of the late 1990s, like Ron Wyden and John Kerry, or the Congressional Black Caucus for many years until 2014, and in fact, many Democrats, which is that uh, the, to apply common carriage regulation to broadband would chill the deployment of broadband and the evolution of broadband services, because common carriage regulation is really fancy lawyer talk for the government gets to run your business in every aspect and tell you how to deploy your service and what prices to set. Now, of course, some people will say, well, isn't this Title II light? Isn't this uh, uh, Title II with forbearance? Well, first of all, as Matt noted, the FCC did not forbear from the core parts of Title II, uh, 201B, 202A. Those are the heart of common carriage regulation. Those are essentially the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887 that was used to regulate the railroads. Those are still on the table. Those can be applied at any time. And the FCC's forbearance saying that they won't do certain things is simply one chairman saying he's not going to do that. That can be reversed at any time. So we have the, the entirety of common carriage regulation on the table. I think that's a terrible idea. I think only Congress can resolve that. I think we're all in agreement that Congress needs to act. But mainly I'm here today to tell you that the Congressional Review Act, the process by which Congress could uh, reinstate the 2015 order, is a distraction. It's not going to pass. It would be a terrible thing if it did. And it is distracting us and, and is threatening to uh, uh, eliminate the window that exists to actually get substantive legislation passed. That's what we should be focused on right now. Thank you for bringing up the CRA. That is actually a great segue into the next question I wanted to ask. Um, so right now there's 50 votes in the Senate in support of a CRA that would roll back the FCC's um, order in December. And so um, I'd love to hear from you guys about what your thoughts are on the significance of if a CRA is able to get through the Senate, since it only needs one more vote at this point. What does that mean? Um, and I think what would that um, set the stage for moving forward for net neutrality? What's most significant about the CRA is that I believe it's galvanized the public. The engagement on this issue is absolutely incredible. It's consistent with what we found in our poll that we did last summer, which show, shows that 80% of Americans really think it's important that the government have some protections in place so that they can access the content that they want to access on the internet and not be discriminated against. The public is using the CRA to send a message to Congress that this issue is really important to them. And it's one that I think everyone in this room and everyone who's looking at this issue needs to pause and think about. Most issues in America right now that are being discussed at the federal level have been controversial, right? It's split America in two. There are lots of things that are being talked about that there's lots of disagreement on, but net neutrality is not one of them. Net neutrality is an 80-20 issue. And the fact that so many people are talking about this is very important and is one that cannot be ignored by our elected representatives. How we get from point A to point B is also worth discussing, right? But I do think we need to acknowledge the importance of the fact that we're even having a conversation about CRA and net neutrality is important and should not be ignored what exactly that means why it is that consumers are engaging on this issue in a way that they're not necessarily engaging on other things and how there's so much agreement in the United States on this issue. I think that's what we need to focus on. Yeah, a quick question on that. I, I'm just wondering beyond, I think, what you see the CRA um, representing symbolically, would you say that it has more of a practical value or moving forward kind of, you know, meaning in that sense. It certainly is, it has a very practical value if it passes both chambers, right? I mean, there are implications for a CRA when Congress has passed it and beyond just the symbolism. And I know that there's a debate right now is can it pass both houses? Would, and if it does, would it be signed by the president? Right. And I think some of that remains to be seen. What has not surprised me, given um, 
how the conversation has evolved over the last several years, um, as we've talked about net neutrality at the different policy points, is how active consumers are. When you think about how we're engaging with the internet today, both from the perspective of a residential consumer, a mobile consumer, um, if you're running a small business, you can't do so without access to the internet and being treated fairly. That is what this is about. And this is why I think we've seen some, so many um, Main Street businesses like become more involved on this issue. This is why we saw Sonus you know, have a debate about this during the Grammys. They put up, you know, the black representing this is what happens if you're blocked. They closed their store on the day of the Grammys. This is why we saw Burger King do a video about what is net neutrality and what does it mean. And I think it's because it has galvanized the public to have this conversation and what it is that they want to see protected. And it's about the fairness. Mm -hmm point, right? They want to be able to access the content that they want to access. They want to be able to publish the content that they want to publish and not have their ISP decide for them what they can access and what it is that they can say. Do you see uh, the CRA reaching that 51st vote in the Senate? I do, yeah. Okay, so CRA 101. So the CRA is an instrument that the Republicans put in place in uh, the contract with America in the mid-90s that allows uh, Congress to undo an agency action and then bar the agency from ever redoing something substantially similar. So in effect, it would not only restore the 2015 order, it would also lock that in until Congress decided uh, otherwise. In other, words, in other words, Title II would become the law of the land. So the CRA is, is not a, a carefully uh, designed tool. The CRA is not about net neutrality. The CRA is about restoring the FCC's broad claims of authority over the internet under Title II as well as Section 706. So that's the first point. Second, procedurally, getting to 51 votes is not actually what you need to move the CRA in the Senate. 51 votes simply allows you to discharge the disapproval resolution, the thing we're referring to as the CRA, from the Senate Commerce Committee and put it on the Senate calendar, not the Senate floor. It's up to the majority leader to decide what's going to happen. And if you think Mitch McConnell is going to allow a vote on that just because uh, there's some second Republican who signs on, which is it, unlikely in itself, if you think that's going to happen, uh, I, you are not being realistic. Okay? The only realistic way to resolve this issue is through substantive legislation. The CRA is, is simply an effort to deflect and distract so that Democrats can say they're doing something without actually doing anything. They know the CRA is not going to pass, and they don't want to talk about substantive legislation. It has now been seven years since Democrats put a substantive legislative vehicle on the table, but they have done so in the past. There have been bipartisan efforts to compromise. In 2010, there was an effort that was led by Democrats where Republicans missed the boat. They miscalculated, figuring that they would be in a better position to negotiate after the midterms. Well, the window closed, and that was a mistake. In 2006, there were no fewer than three bills, two in committee, and then the Communications Act update of 2006, all of which had bipartisan support that would have resolved this issue. We have spent the last 12 years arguing about this because we missed the opportunity to, to do substantive legislation, and that's what people are, are proposing to do right now when they talk about the CRA. It's not going to resolve these issues, and I would also point out to you everything that was said last year when Republicans used a CRA to roll back the broadband privacy order at the FCC, and every Democrat cried about how, what, what a blunt tool this was, how inappropriate it was to, to use the CRA in that fashion. The hypocrisy here is rank. We need to stop playing politics with this issue, and sure, yes, people agree on net neutrality, so let's have a piece of a net neutrality legislation Every moment we spend discussing the CRA and state legislation that is going to be overturned is time wasted that we could be spending on, deep, on working out the details of substantive legislation. Uh, so just to add to that history, uh, Barron noted the, the many bills that have been introduced over time uh, to try to get net neutrality protections from Congress. Uh, uh, they've all failed. Um, and 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 it points to the difficulty that we have uh, as policymakers and as stakeholders getting to uh, an agreement on this issue. And, and I find that it, it's, that disagreement is not about the core net neutrality principles. Uh, 
It seems to be about everything else that comes with the power of the FCC to protect consumers. And so, you know, that, that's where we're going to find a lot of disagreement here, I think, because, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we support the CRA effort uh, is because uh, it restores the protections that this uprising, the, you know, the 80-20 the that uh, Andrew's talking about, that, that there's huge consensus on it, restores it quickly. Um, it's not mutually exclusive of doing uh, broader legislation around the Communications Act and updating it. Uh, but that that uh, that sort of comprehensive legislation ne would need to be carefully crafted. It would need to look at a variety of important consumer protections, some of the ones that I named earlier, uh, that, that we find that uh, many of the folks who are opposed to either restoring net neutrality through the CRA or oppose the rules that were repealed uh, last year uh, seem to have real concerns about. Uh, you know, and, and that's where the disagreements seem to be. You know, should you have an agency that's empowered to look at whether consumers are being gouged as prices continue to go up on them on their broadband service? There seems to be a lot of disagreement about that. Um, and so, you know, the opportunity to restore the net neutrality rules quickly through a CRA is a great opportunity. I, you know, yeah, I wish there could be, and, and if there is, you know, we're open to looking at, you know, legislation outside of the CRA to get there. But the problem is, is that whenever we see legislation, uh, and, you know, the most recent examples, uh, you know, Ms. Blackburn's bill that's out there right now, uh, the John Thune's bill in 2015, uh, they, they've been bills that drastically limit the ability of the FCC to do its job and protect consumers on broadband generally. Uh, and I think that's where a lot of the, the disagreement is, as opposed to the, the core principles of net neutrality. Yeah, so remember that the FCC promised us that they weren't going to do price regulation, because price regulation has always been the core concern that led the FCC in, 19, in the late 1990s under Democratic chairman not to impose Title II on the Internet. He talked about the dangers of subjecting the cable pipe to the morass of Title II. Price regulation was at the top of his list. That's why the FCC, when they first floated this idea in 2010, says, oh, don't worry, we're not going to do price regulation. Tom Wheeler assured us we're not going to do price regulation. And now Chris says, yeah, but you know, we want the FCC to be able to look at consumers being gouged in prices. What Chris is talking about is he wants price regulation. Gigi Sohn has, has frankly admitted this. Th th they're, not, they're not hiding their agenda. They want to be able to use the full gamut of Title II regulation, the very things that sensible, centrist Democrats and all Republicans have always recognized would be disastrous for broadband deployment. They're now trying to dress that up as saying, well, we need those powers to protect consumers. No, we don't. We need, we, need, we need core, limited, defined powers to enforce core rules and to police anti-competitive behavior. I think the Federal Trade Commission is actually in a very good position to do that, but I'm happy to talk about what legislation should look like. And we don't need Title II to do that. And one of the many reasons that we don't need Title II, a lot of people here have never actually read the Communications Act. They don't realize, for example, go read Section 606 of the Communications Act, the war powers of the president. Does anybody realize that Donald Trump, in a time of war, which we are in now, thanks to the 2001 declaration of war around the world, which is going to be perpetual, Donald Trump has the authority over all common carriers to, to declare that he gets to decide what gets prioritized and, what given, and given preference. In other words, Title II, in fact, assures the opposite of net neutrality for this administration when they want to do so. That's the kind of thing that's buried in Title II. Nobody wants that, except maybe someone in the administration. We shouldn't have that on the table. And we can, we can avoid that kind of problem by having legislation that is specific to net neutrality concerns that doesn't subsume the internet in, in the morass, as Bill Kennard, Bill Clinton's FCC chairman put it, of Title II regulation. Chris, if you want to respond to that, and then we'll move on to the next question. Sure. I I think Barron illustrated my point that we don't disagree on net neutrality principles. We disagree on the power of the agency and what that should look like. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, the, the example of increasing prices, whether you call it price regulation or whether you call it consumer protection, we have a difference of opinion on whether uh, as consumers continue to see their prices rise, and we've documented this and it continues to go up, uh, should there be an agency that says, uh, that, that is empowered to look at those prices and see uh, how it's impacting consumers, uh, whether they have a lack of choice, whether there's a monopoly choice, uh, and, and what that means for pricing. Um, uh, whether, you know, it, it doesn't have to mean uh, explicit setting of prices, 
but perhaps there should be something uh, discussed by policymakers based on that analysis. If we don't have an agency that's even empowered to look at these things, then I highly doubt that, you know, if you look at the speed that Congress is moving on something that has 80% support, uh, I highly doubt that we're going to get something from Congress that really empowers the agency to look at these sorts of concerns. And that's just one issue of consumer protection. Mm -hmm. So, y you know, I think it's helpful that getting a lot of agreement on the fact that the net neutrality issues that are wrapped up in this debate about Title II um, probably are issues where we do have a fair amount of agreement, and I'm sure we'll get into the specifics of that. I, I do want to echo the point Barron made, w which is that rate regulation is not a net neutrality issue at all. And on the merits of that question, you know, we have an industry that's incredibly capital intensive, and, and we have a challenge as a society to build out additional broadband connections to reach underserved areas, whether it's rural areas or, or, or parts of urban communities. We have a challenge to continually increase speeds to keep up with consumer demands for streaming video and other bandwidth intensive applications. And it's really economics 101 that if we want the private sector to continually invest billions and billions of dollars, we cannot impose a public utility model of regulation that is going to inhibit that kind of investment. The threat of government saying, I will tell you later if I think your prices are reasonable is not a recipe for investment. And I think there is pretty broad consensus on that principle. Most of the people on both sides of the aisle that, that feel passionately about net neutrality protection aren't arguing about rate regulation. We're talking about blocking and throttling and prioritization issues that are, uh, I think, more consensus driven. So I think that the debate here is going to be a lot more positive if we focus on those net neutrality issues. The CRA, as Barron points out, would lock in a 1930s utility model of regulation that actually goes back to railroad regulation from the 19th century that is not a, a proper fit for broadband and not a good recipe for, for the broadband economy to thrive. I want to um, make, I, I, I know I've gone, but I want to make one final point. This is not just about broadband. This is about internet services. The FCC has jurisdiction over all communications, so any service that uses communications point to point is subject to the agency's jurisdiction, and the FCC's 2015 order implicates other services as well. Tech Freedom is the intervener against the FCC's order, not on behalf of broadband companies, on behalf of Silicon Valley entrepreneurs who are concerned that the FCC's logic for reclassifying broadband by declaring the internet to, to be the same thing as the public switch telephone network has opened the door to the FCC regulating as communications under Title II edge services like voice over internet service. That's just Title II. Section 706, if it is a grant of authority, would also be locked in by the, by the CRA. That gives the FCC authority over not just broadband, but any form of communication. So things like that, like talking to your phone, those are all things that the FCC could regulate. That's crazy. Congress never intended that, and yet the CRA would lock those things in. All right, so I think the next topic <laughs> that we are gonna cover, which we've all discussed a little bit, is just the fact that there's been a huge impasse for legislation. So even the idea that we want legislation, everyone seems to agree on that. Um, that hasn't really been able to happen for a very long time. So I'm wondering what you guys think needs to happen in order for real legislation that you can consider that would actually make its way through Congress, what would need to happen for that to take place? Well, I, I could start. I mean, I think on the plus side, th there is quite a bit of consensus. And when you compare this issue to many others that Congress grapples with, we're starting with more agreement than is typical, than is typical of an issue like health care or some other more complex issues. So what do we agree on? We agree on transparency. Everybody agrees that broadband providers should f fully disclose their prices, their, their network management practices, and other key attributes of service. We agree there shouldn't be blocking of, of lawful traffic. We agree there shouldn't be throttling of network traffic. And there are a couple issues that become a little bit more complicated. So paid prioritization is one that's gotten a lot of heat and discussion. I think there's broad consensus that nobody wants anti-competitive um, fast lanes and slow lanes that are, that are decided on the basis of affiliation or that have other anti-competitive effects. It's going to take some work on a bipartisan basis to define exactly what kind of oversight mechanism should exist for paid prioritization or other forms of discrimination, but that's a solvable problem. And I know Angie's members, she'll talk about interconnection. That's another issue where my clients believe there's a marketplace that's working. We believe that there's no need for regulation, but, but you can have a, a responsible conversation about what an oversight mechanism might look like. In my view, it would need to be bilateral. There are a lot of small ISPs that feel they get, they get um, 
pushed around by very large edge providers. A company like Netflix has its own content delivery network. It's responsible for about 40% of internet traffic. If you're a small ISP trying to negotiate connectivity with a company like Netflix, they have the leverage, not the ISP. On the other hand, some of the largest ISPs um, have the ability to impose um, paid peering arrangements and other things. If we're going to have a conversation about economic regulation of those arrangements, even though they've worked well and prices for transit have plummeted and there are very few impasses, we can have that conversation, but it's going to need to be a bilateral conversation, not one side imposing regulation on the other to get economic advantage. Would you like me to respond yeah, to that? Go for it. And as Matt indicated, I think there, there, there are areas where there's general agreement, and then as you get down into the details of it, um, I think you'll find that there's more disagreement than agreement, and things will need to be um, discussed. I, I think at the high level, what's really important is to be pushing the industry and consumer groups to be talking to one another to try to solve the problem so that um, the staff here aren't the ones that are trying to negotiate. Um, so I would say that should be one of the very first principles is that people should be having these conversations about how to solve the issues and bring them to the lawmakers. That would be a very useful development. Um, while we have heard that certain companies you know, are very interested in legislating, I think we've yet to see the demonstration of companies and public interest groups coming together in a round table and having these conversations. And Encompass is open to doing that, and we would love to do that. We've had a few that have outreached to us recently, so we have some upcoming conversations that are happening. But I think more needs to be done to resolve the issues on behalf of staff and the members here in Congress, and we look forward to working on that. With respect to the interconnection issue, I want to say this. It is not the edge providers who have been the ones who've been accused of not cooperating when it comes to interconnection. And we have a number of proceedings that have happened at the FCC outside of open internet where a lot of evidence has been presented on the interconnection issues. And it has been large ISPs who are also very large video content delivery, the traditional MVPD business, um, MVPD services that have been problematic. So where there isn't a problem that needs to be solved, I don't think we should be asking Congress to solve it. Where there is a problem, that is what we should be asking Congress to handle. And I would, I would just agree. I, I think there's an opportunity to bring all stakeholders together that we haven't really seen legislators engage in and, and we'd be willing to participate in. Um, uh, and, and to acknowledge the, the very different uh, uh, concerns that folks have uh, around the issue uh, on, on specific points, whether it's you know the, deciding what to do with paid privatization that Matt was talking about, uh, or uh, you know defining you know how to, how to protect interconnection, uh, I think it also extends to some of the uh, uh, concerns around the power of the agency and and either you know if if Congress is going to you know deal with that and try to either they have to be silent on that uh, to deal with it another time or they need to take it head on and and. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that would make it easier for different groups to come to the table that uh, have, have to this point, you know, uh, probably agreed on some of the core issues. Mm -hmm. Well, oh. I, Angie, I, I appreciate your offer. I'd be happy to talk about legislation. Uh, I made that same offer to public knowledge in late 2013, and they weren't interested. Um, they, were, they wanted to see how the court decision went, and they wanted to keep fighting about this. And in general, the dynamic here has been that everyone at various points in this, in this conversation has looked for a reason to delay. Well, the people who are not delaying right now, at this particular moment, Republicans have offered legislation. You may not like it, but let's see your legislation. Let's see proposals from Democrats. And we've gone, and I know I've gone in to meet with Republicans about their legislation, so we continue to be open to these discussions. Again, there has been no text put on the table from Democrats or from any organization that I'm aware of on the other side of this debate in seven years. The, the, the Thune-Upton bill, the Blackburn bill, those are adaptations of Henry Waxman's bill from 2010, the bill that Republicans should have taken at that time. This is the conversation that we should be having. The reason that it hasn't happened is right now, number one, we're wasting our time talking about the CRA and people are pretending that that's gonna resolve this issue and it's not going to. Two, there, there are people for whom uh, the term net neutrality has been expanded greatly to cover things that it never meant before. Interconnection, Tom Wheeler acknowledged, in 2014, it's a different issue, and yet now that's part of net neutrality, thanks to companies like Netflix cynically manipulating this conversation. Three, 
this conversation has largely become, and Chris has said this about five times, about ensuring that the FCC, whatever happens, continues to have a blank check to do whatever it wants. Well, that's just not acceptable to people who worry about the agency's uh, unchecked discretion. That's, in fact, the basic trade-off for legislation is say that Title II is not uh, a common care, excuse me, that uh, broadband is not a Title II service, that Section 706 doesn't let the agency do whatever it wants, and then create specific rules to enforce. If people are saying that that's not a, a potentially adequate basis for compromise, what they're really saying is they don't ever want legislation. They want to continue fighting about this. And finally, the, the reason this hasn't been resolved is there are, are, of course, Democrats, I'm sure there are Democrats in this room who want legislation. There have been in the past. Unfortunately, President Obama decided to make this a partisan electoral issue in 2014 when he attempted to redefine uh, net neutrality to mean Title II regulation of the Internet. And unfortunately, that framing has made it impossible for Democrats to do what they have tried to do in the past, to come to the table and negotiate around legislation. So until we can somehow get around that, I fear this is not going to happen, and we're going to spend the next 10 or maybe 20 years continuing to go back and forth from Republican to Democratic FCC about this issue, that's not the kind of long-term certainty that anyone needs to make investments in broadband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to note, um, back on the earlier question that you asked about substantive net neutrality legislation and what we've seen so far that I think the pro-net neutrality public interest groups, including Encompass, have not been completely satisfied with. I, in case you all had not seen last week, um, Congressman Mike Kaufman from the Denver area came to Encompass's policy summit and gave about a 10-minute speech on net neutrality and focused why it is that those protections are so important that were um, found to be legally upheld by the D.C. Circuit twice from the 2015 order and why he's now working on legislation that would enshrine those protections in law. And we look forward to seeing um, that bill. We haven't seen a draft yet, but we look forward to seeing that bill. And we think that it, when we appreciate the congressman noting how important net neutrality is, important enough that he's willing to work on legislation, put his name on it, try to find bipartisan support for it. So we look forward to working on that. Baron, we also look forward to you know, working with the other organizations that have spent a lot of time on this over the last couple of decades. How it is that we can come to an agreement and help push forward legislation that is going to protect consumers. As we indicated, there are some details that will need to be worked out, but I think coming together and having real conversations about that is gonna be really important. Um, and focusing on the actual facts not a he said, she said, but what are the actual facts? And we have a long track record of what those facts are. Past actions that have been taken, what it is that needs to be protected to ensure consumers get the fair access to the content that we were talking about previously, both in terms of what they want to access themselves and in terms of what they want to publish themselves, because it is a two-way market, right? And this isn't just about consumers consuming, this is also about consumers producing. So we look forward to working on that with all, all of the groups that are represented here. I also wanted to ask you guys what your thoughts are on what's happening in the states right now and the fact that you have a number of states introducing their own bills to protect net neutrality, um, as well as various executive orders that are looking at the procurement process and kind of limiting companies that don't respect net neutrality um, to from being in those processes, if you think that's um, something that's going to stand, given the FCC's efforts to preempt state rules, mm -hmm. um, as well as if you see those being as an alternative way for net neutrality to kind of be preserved if that's the effort you're going for. Well, I, I do think, I, before the substance, I do think it gets back to the point that I was making about how consumers feel about this issue. Some of this is about the symbolism. Well, if the federal government isn't going to protect me, I'm going to ask my state government to protect me. So we need to keep that in mind, that this is really being driven by the outcry by the public. And I think that can't be lost on, on this conversation of why this is so important. Um, from the perspective of the FCC, like how far does its jurisdiction go, whether or not the preemption section of the order would preempt, preempt some of these state actions and not others, I think it's, re I think it's really hard to know. 
at this point, like how a court's going to view that. Uh, my personal opinion, this has not been blessed by my members, but my personal opinion is some of the executive orders that get to, um, you want to be a service provider to a state agency, hence you then also have to abide by net neutrality obligations. I think that's a much more difficult nut to crack because an ISP is opting into those contracts and the conditions of those contracts versus outright net neutrality regulation that would be implemented like a, a state commission or the state legislative body implementing that. I think that's a different per, uh, a, a different set of regulation that may get a different perspective out of a court. So s some of these questions we've been discussing are certainly hard. I think this one's really easy. So net neutrality has to be addressed at the federal level. As I mentioned earlier, it is quintessentially an interstate issue. The internet is not subject to state boundaries. The FCC has found under Democrat and Republican administrations that you cannot sever the intrastate components, whatever they may be with respect to internet access and regulate them without regulating the entirety of the internet. And that has problems not only under federal preemption, but under the Commerce Clause. So the 2015 order, the Title II order, Paragraph 433, preempted states equally because the, the FCC said we have a carefully calibrated regime and states can interfere with it. At that time, they may have worried about states watering down net neutrality more than states adding to it. This order, the, the 2017 order, is more about preventing states perhaps from regulating in a different direction. But the legal principle is the same. This is not an issue for states. It doesn't matter if they attempt to regulate net neutrality directly or indirectly. The Supreme Court has held repeatedly that states can't use procurement laws as a backdoor means of imposing regulation. There's a case called Commerce Committee versus Brown, another one called Gould, another one called Boston Harbor, where all of these cases turned on state efforts to use their purchasing power to impose regulations. The reason that those fail equally is that the states that have adopted executive orders aren't saying, here's what you need to do in your service to me. Uh, they're not saying you have to provide service to the state in a particular manner. They're saying if you want to do business with the state, you have, to you have to provide service to consumers in a particular manner. That's just regulating at the state level in a way that the FCC has squarely foreclosed. Now, to be sure, parties that challenge the FCC's order in the D.C. Circuit or other courts of appeals will have the opportunity to challenge whether the FCC had authority to preempt or whether it overstepped its bounds. What, what can't happen is individual states for symbolic reasons or other, testing that proposition. It's a, it's a huge waste of public resources. It's a distraction from the congressional debate we should be having, and it's really not uh, a constructive exercise. Two, two, two quick points. Uh, the states are being very open that their purpose is regulatory. I mean, they are just, they're writing these um, orders and the text around them in such a way as to make the, the judge's decisions very easy. It's not the states exercising their proprietary interest over their own pr procurement, for example. It is simply them trying to have a regulatory effect on the market. That's just in their own statements. You don't need to, to, to do any detective work to figure that out. And second, this is a distraction not only from legislation at the federal level, it's a distraction at the state level. Because right now, the, um, the open internet order from last year, the Restoring Internet Freedom Order, turned authority over broadband back to the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice at the federal level, but also the states in enforcing their generally applicable consumer protection and competition laws. And that's as it should be. If there are uh, real problems with competition and consumer protection in the market, the states have the ability to bring lawsuits. Now, every single one of these state governors and state legislators could be, instead of putting forward executive orders and legislation they are gonna be struck down, they could be instead holding hearings, drafting legislation, and asking what resources does our state AG's office have to deal with broadband concerns? Do they have enough people? Do they need to hire more? Should they be working together on an interstate basis just as the state AGs handle competition cases? Those are all legitimate questions. Those are things the states can do within their, their legitimate police powers that do not constitute uh, an attempting to replicate federal telecommunications regulation and no one's doing that because this is all about symbolism. And while some people might think that's a good thing, it is in fact a waste of public resources, a distraction, and an abuse of, of the legislative process to do things that and people realize are not actually going to stand up, that are just being done for political ends. So uh, there are two state actions you see happening there. Uh, there's the legislative and the um, 
the executive order actions that are taking place. And then there's also 20 some attorneys generals who have challenged in court uh, uh, the decision at the FCC last year. Um, you know, I think all those taken in total, I agree with Andrew, are, are a real sign of the uh, discontent uh, publicly with uh, the decision that the FCC took. And, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know the legal history like Matt does about, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the authority for states to get into, uh, into uh, these sorts of uh, network issues, but I, I think it's challenging generally and why, you know, folks look to the FCC for so long to protect net neutrality um, to have, uh, you know, uh, different states trying different things. Uh, it is simpler uh, to, to have the FCC act, and when the FCC has taken itself off the field um, uh, from protecting consumers around net neutrality for the first time, uh, that's, I think that's why you see this sort of outpouring of actions at the state level. So, um, you know, whether it's symbolism or not, I think it's important to, to take note of it. Uh, it just shows the overwhelming support for these protections and the fact that we need to have action soon to, to restore the protections that have been lost. Uh, uh, no one is fooled that the FTC is able to actually protect consumers from blocking or throttling uh, in any significant way. Uh, they, have, they have the ability to enforce in very specific ways uh, uh, consumer protection based on the promises made by companies or antitrust protections. Uh, and, and that's very limiting. And, and uh, there's really been uh, uh, no record of the F FTC being able to protect f folks in the way that consumers are really looking for when they have so few choices for access to the internet. Uh, uh, this is why we need bright line rules. This is why we've seen, uh, uh, whether it's bills that you know, uh, public knowledge has criticized in the past, introduced in Congress, uh, suggesting that there should be bright line rules. There's a real consensus that having bright line rules that are proactively protecting consumers is, is accepted across the board. And so I think that's the starting point and we move from there. I, I have to respond here as uh, I spend uh, about half my time on the Federal Trade Commission. Most people who talk about this issue, uh, frankly, don't understand the FTC's authority. The FTC, yes, uh, its baseline authority is enforcing promises that companies make. And right now, Broadband providers, all of them, have, have promised to abide by the 2015 rules. Now, that could change. That's true. But the FTC's authority doesn't end there. The FTC has the authority to, to use that deception power against material omissions, which is a very important authority. If, if a company simply doesn't tell you something, that can, in fact, be a very material omission. That's an easy case to make. The FTC has the authority to enforce the antitrust laws, as Chris noted. But the part of this that always gets left out is the FTC has, in fact, the broadest authority, perhaps of any agency in America, to police practices that it determines are unfair. That actually gives the agency broad discretion over consumer protection matters. Now, we don't know how broad, in, mainly because in 2008, when the FTC was ready to bring the first net neutrality enforcement action against Comcast, and the Democrat and Republican uh, chairman and ranking member on the FTC were in agreement about bringing that enforcement action, the Republican chairman of the FCC insisted that his agency was going to decide these issues, and we have since wasted the last decade bickering and litigating about the F FCC's legal authority. There is an alternate timeline in which the FTC started bringing those enforcement actions, and we would actually know what that enforcement uh, action case law would look like. We know some of it because the FTC has brought enforcement actions in areas related to net neutrality, such as the AT&T case around billing practices. So it's just not true that the agency doesn't have broad authority. It does. If we want to fill in those gaps, legislation is the way to do it. But just to be clear, the sky's not going to fall. Even if there is no legislation and the FTC and the state AGs and the Department of Justice handle this issue until the next Democratic FCC reinstates Title II, they will be able to bring enforcement actions, and I assure you that they will be quite aggressive about doing it. So we are running out of time, and I want to open it up to audience questions. But before we do, if you guys could just um, go down the line really quickly um, in one to two words, kind of say what you would like to see as the next step um, related to net neutrality. We'll start with you, Darren. Uh, legislation that doesn't give the federal government, and in particular Donald Trump, broad authority to control the Internet. Uh, we'd like to see the CRA restore the rules and, and have Congress uh, work together with stakeholders to, you know, uh, update the Communications Act so that it protects consumers generally. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'd like to see 
bipartisan legislation that addresses net neutrality in a way that protects consumers, but also promotes a, an, an investment-friendly and an appropriately targeted regime. A reinstatement of the 2015 protections so consumers feel confident that they're getting the fair deal that we should be giving them. Great, thank you. Um, and I want to open it up to audience questions. So yeah, if you want to go. One thing I think is important to keep in mind um, relates to Barron's point that the sky isn't falling is l l let's not forget how much has been accomplished by the private sector in this area. For, for Despite recent debates about Title II, which really intensified in 2015 and became a gigantic political issue, the Internet for almost all of its existence has been driven by consensus, public-private um, efforts that, that have not involved significant legislation, have not involved significant regulation. And we've had enormous growth of the Internet. We've had really an unprecedented technological and civic explosion. It's enormously positive. And broadband companies that I represent are well aware of what their customers want. They don't want, their customers certainly don't want to be interfered with and blocked and throttled. And the marketplace is going to drive providers to meet their customers' needs. So I think the marketplace is going to deliver terrific services, high quality. It would be terrific if we could um, end the sniping and the, the fear mongering and, and actually put in place a consumer bill of rights that everybody can agree on. But if we can, I think we're going to still see tremendous progress in, in the private sector. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned about what you mentioned. Uh, we saw uh, some efforts, uh, oh God, when was this now? I'm losing track of years. Uh, I think it was 2013 or 2014. Uh, where uh, Mr. Upton and Mr. Walden and, and the and House Energy and Commerce Committee tried to begin a conversation around updating uh, communications law. And, uh, and, and unfortunately, that fell apart, I think, largely because of the push at the FCC uh, to protect net neutrality. And unfortunately, you know, we've seen other policy debates, discussions that should be happening, whether it's around IoT, whether it's around privacy, whether it's uh, around uh, affordable access to broadband, uh, get sidelined because of this issue. Um, uh, I think you know the sooner we can resolve it, the better, because there are a lot of concerns that are being ignored. Uh, whether we agree on them or not as a panel, you know, I, you know, I, I highlight our, the concerns around affordable access. Uh, I would add to that uh, uh, just general access to high-speed broadband and what we consider uh, high-quality broadband is, is something that needs to be debated publicly that uh, we think is getting ignored at times uh, by uh, the Federal Communications Commission and by policymakers here in Congress. Um, uh, so there's a lot of issues around technology, uh, certainly the, the, the growing dominance of, of online platforms and what that means for consumers uh, and their choices uh, is another one. We, we, we ignore these at our peril when we only focus on the one high-profile issue that is, you know, funding lobbyists in this city. <laughs> well, fortunately, we already have the antitrust laws, so th those issues will be dealt with if they are real issues and not fake issues. Uh, but broadband deployment is a, real, is a real problem right now. There are significant barriers to broadband deployment, and the FCC's authority to deal with those is limited to telecommunications services. They can only indirectly apply those things to broadband, which is a problem. And those provisions don't cover the most important assets out there, which are those owned by governments. Local and state governments have practices that do constitute real barriers to broadband deployment. The FCC doesn't have the power to deal with them today, and it should. And that's not going to happen as long as we're wasting our time bickering about this issue. I'll take that one. So both the Commission and the Department of Justice have looked very closely at these issues, especially as it relates to the over-the-top streaming business and the incentives that large ISPs who are also large multi-channel video providers, distributors, and their incentives to slow down over-the-top competition. In fact, um, one of the most recent mergers was the Charter Time Warner Cable merger, and both the Commission and the Department of Justice instituted conditions in order to protect over-the-top competition to ensure that consumers would have more choice for their streaming services. 
And if you look at the DOJ complaint right now, pending against AT&T Time Warner, in part, part of the issue is the incentive that AT&T has to slow down video competition over the internet in order to protect the direct TV business. That is part of the complaint that is set out by DOJ. I just would say quickly in response, I don't, I don't think there's any basis to conclude that mergers have really had any material impact on this debate. If we look at some of the largest broadband providers, AT&T, Comcast, Verizon, Charter, they're all very strongly supportive of net neutrality. They've made strong public commitments. at and is running ads in the Washington Post for, for supporting legislation, Consumer Bill of Rights. And you know, when we go back to the few incidents throughout history that have been cited as net neutrality examples, the, the first, the seminal example, is named after a company called Madison River which was alleged to have blocked VoIP traffic. It's a tiny little company with a, with a tiny number of customers. So these are, these are important policy questions, but I don't think there's any credible basis to conclude that the size of the providers has had an impact. If anything, the largest providers seem particularly attuned to the fact that they're gonna be held accountable by Congress, by consumers, by social media, and by everyone for their conduct. What's made, what's made these mergers highlight net neutrality so much is, is the type of mergers that they are. You see companies that own the infrastructure of the internet, the, the, that are in charge of transit now acquiring more and more content. And so they have content that they own, that they can benefit uh, from, from preferencing uh, that, uh, that folks are concerned that we'll see uh, more and more of self-preferencing of their own content through uh, either pre-prioritization or other sorts of uh, management of traffic that is, is we would consider unreasonable under the old rules at the FCC. Um, so it's that sort of uh, vertical mergers that, that we're really concerned about uh, and, and make net neutrality even more important. It's great that companies are saying that they support net neutrality principles, uh, but if there's uh, nothing there to force them, I mean, Madison River is a great example, it's because the FCC has said for years that they will enforce net neutrality that uh, many companies have come to the table and said, okay, well then we can agree to these things. But as soon as that goes away over time, uh, when we've already started to see some of this, uh, companies will dial back what they think are protections that are important for them to continue to live up to. I think, unfortunately, this is all the time we have for questions, but I did want to say it's been a um, fantastic panel that the Congressional Internet Project Academy is putting on about privacy and our regulation, um, and you can catch that on March 9th. Thank you so much to everyone for being here, and thank you to our fantastic <laughs> panel.